Welcome to London Lights. I'm pleased to have as my guest today, Terry McManus. Terry, welcome to the program. Thanks, Dan. Let me just read a little bio about you here. Uh, Terry is a Londoner and a founding member of the Music Industry Arts Program at Fanshawe College, and he remains a guest lecturer. He's also a singer-songwriter and had three tunes go to number one in the prairies. I listened to the song, Sun Shower in the Spring, uh, Terry, on YouTube, and I quite liked it. Oh, good. He's written articles and textbooks relating to the musical industry and uh, legal issues and teaches entertainment contracts. Most importantly for our purposes today, he worked extensively with Jack Richardson during their time together at Fanshawe College, and he's familiar with Jack's history and methods and techniques. Terry, welcome to the program. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be here. It's good to have you. Now, despite your amazing accomplishments, you're not the reason why we're doing this show. <laughs> but thank you for agreeing to do it because you're one of the uh, local experts on Jack Richardson and what he was all about. Oh, yeah. Happy so, to talk about Jack anytime. Great. There's two real reasons why I wanted to do this show. One is shown in the picture behind me because of that great Canadian band, probably the greatest Canadian rock band, the Guess Who, <laughs> and also Jack Richardson, who worked with the Guess Who and produced them through their heyday and their biggest years. Um, Jack was a, a music producer extraordinaire. He was considered the godfather or grandfather of musical production in London. So we really wanna do some tribute to him tonight and talk about him a little bit. In fact, I saw a clip of Burton Cummings of the Guess Who talking about Jack Richardson as if he was their George Martin. George Martin being that great producer of the Beatles. And that's what Jack Richardson was to the Guess Who. Perhaps one of the secrets to their success. What do you know about that uh, involvement? Well, um, I shared an office with Jack for 19 years, so I got to hear a lot of stories. <laughs> and uh, Jack brought musicality to the group. I mean, it, this was a rock band, and, and they certainly had, had good musical taste, and, and they had good writing chops. But Jack brought that, that bit of formal training. You know, he had uh, done the Eastman School of Music with Phil Ramone and David Green uh, uh, in the uh, 60s. And um, all, of, uh, all of the people who came out of the Eastman School of Music had that touch of musicality that a lot of bands don't realize is important for success. A lot of bands think, oh, you throw an arrangement, a head arrangement together, you go in the studio and you cut it. And, and that might have happened for, you know, a, a few bands here and there. But like you said, George Martin with the Beatles made a tremendous difference uh, to their music. And, and I think that Jack did the same thing with the Guess Who. He didn't tell them what to write and he didn't tell them how to write it. But, but once they'd written it and, and he was in charge of the recording, he brought out the best parts of it. Wow. Well, he must have done the same with you. You shared an office with him for 19 years. That's right. He kept stealing my pens. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about the great things that Jack accomplished during his career. But let's go back to the beginning with Jack and what you know about his history. How did he get his start in music and how did his rise come about? Well, Jack was a bass player, and uh, there are many pictures uh, around of him playing the bass. Uh, and uh, actually, one of the mo more famous ones is where Jack's, they've done a, a caricature of him, and it, it have the round mound of sound on his shirt with him playing the bass. You know, that's uh, the picture most people have of him. Uh, he, he started off in a dance band and uh, gradually got some work with the CBC, which uh, led to a higher profile. I, I actually saw a clip once of him on a CBC show. It was in passing, mind you, as a camera pan, but uh, it was definitely Jack. Uh, then Jack um, uh, expanded a, a little bit uh, from the CBC and started doing commercials playing on commercials and that sparked his interest in producing commercials 
And uh, so, so it was kind of a step musician, uh, you know, you, you get a wider circle of uh, influence and then you come across something, in Jack's case, the uh, advertising industry, where yeah. he had, uh, he had a, a specific talent. He could recognize music that would help to sell products. Right. Well, I love the story of his rise because I was there when it happened. And when I say there, I was growing up. Uh, right. And I remember the steps along the way. So I remember hearing about Nimbus 9. That was the yes. studio that he started. And then right. I remember uh, being, a, a as a boy, loving pop, Coca-Cola. And then hearing about this uh, promotion that Jack had put together with Coca-Cola. Yes. To, you, you collect your bottle tops off your Coke, and you send it in with a dollar, and you get this album or an EP of some type with two bands on it. One was an Ottawa band, the Staccatos, who became... Five-man electrical band. Five-man electrical band. Right. And then they wanted to create a bit of a mystery about this other band that was on there. So they called them the Guess Who, because they were yes. so good. They thought, well, people might think it's an English band. Who is it? Yes. Yeah. The Beatles, what's going on here? So it was a tremendous marketing plan, and it really worked. And I think that was Jack's introduction to the Guess Who, correct? That's right. Uh, the album was called A Wild Pair, actually. Mm. And uh, one side to Guess Who, the other side the Staccatos. And the Guess Who's name came about, you're right, uh, to kind of make people guess who it was. But they were afraid that they couldn't get Canadian airplay mm. uh, as, you know, what they'd been under, which was various names at the time. So the, I think it was George Struth of Quality Records who said, let's put it out as the Guess Who, and everyone will think it's an English band. Yeah, right. Now, this was before Jack got in. This was with Shaken All Over. Okay. And then Jack heard some of their original material, and he really liked it. He, he, he heard the, uh, the talent in there, and that's what brought them into the Coca-Cola fold. Right. Well, the next step in the story is something that has always amazed me. And that was the part where Jack decides he's going to take a chance on this band, the Guess Who. And he hears their talent. He knows what they're capable of. He knows this song, These Eyes, and he wants to take them to New York to record them. But the band has no money and Jack doesn't have the money to do that. Right. So he takes a big gamble and takes a risk and mortgages his house to raise the money, to go to New York with the guess who. They record these eyes. It's a massive hit. And the rest, of course, is history. Yes, yeah. Uh, one of the things about that mortgaging the house is that Shirley, his wife, once told me that she, he had never told her that he had put that <laughs> second mortgage on the house. That was back in the days when, you know, men could probably uh, do what they wanted with the money. But uh, right. uh, certainly, uh, you know, after that, Shirley kept a, an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's interesting you mentioned that because I always wondered, I wonder how the wife felt about that. And I guess, you know, she, was... she Shirley uh, Richardson was one of the most wonderful, effusive persons you would ever want to meet. Every, I, Anytime she met somebody when she'd meet me, she'd, well, Terry, how are you? You know, just like that. And and there was no hidden agendas with Shirley. She put everything right right out front. And I think it was really good for Jack to be yeah. married. She was a great singer, by the way. Okay. In the 50s and 60s, that's how Jack and Shirley met. She oh. was a singer uh, and uh, ended up singing in his band. Very you cool. Know? You know, so... Well, they so these eyes hits, and now yes. Guess Who is getting this national attention. Right. And Jack is there as they build their career. Right. These eyes, laughing, uh, she's come undone. Yeah. The band just starts to hit its stride. And then right up to American Woman, which becomes right. a song that just takes the nation by storm. And it's yes. still an iconic Canadian record. Right. Jack's right. all part of that uh, story, correct? Oh, a very important part of that. because. There, there are a number of things that go into being successful. And uh, one of those things is the actual recording itself. When they signed with RCA, they had to use the RCA studios. 
uh, that was after they had recorded um, the first album at a and Studios with David Green. As soon as they signed up with RCA, they had to go use the RCA Studios in New York, and Jack didn't like them. Jack mm -hmm. didn't like the sound, the whatever. And he came back, he almost stopped producing them because he came back from New York after that uh, second album date and said, I don't think I can do this band. It just, uh, it's just not there. And um, then he heard some stuff done by Brian Christian in Chicago, an engineer, and who is an RCA studio. And so he took the band to there and the rest is history. Oh, wow. The one well, other thing you mentioned yeah. about laughing was yeah. that the band was very reticent about doing laughing because they were a rock and roll band. Mm. And having two ballads in a row, they were afraid might slot them, but it didn't. <laughs> well, of course, in the industry, when uh, when you have hit records like that, people start to take notice. Yes. And uh, Jack's list of clients is long and impressive. Alice Cooper, yeah. Bob Seeger, Peter Gabriel, Pink Floyd, Badfinger, the Irish Rovers, Max Webster. That's an impressive list of clients. And we're going to be right back with Terry McManus to talk about some of them and to talk about this great story of Jack Richardson, Canada's premier music producer. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back now with Terry McManus. We're talking about Jack Richardson. Yeah, I want to just tell you about a little story that happened with me. My first year as a lawyer in London, uh, I was involved with a case where Alice Cooper was named as a defendant. And I think the reason why I got hired was because I was the only guy that was willing to go to LA to do a week of discoveries. So uh, down I went and uh, there I was in an examination for discovery with Alice Cooper thinking, I love this guy's music, I'm a fan, and here I am, he's a defendant in this lawsuit. Now, how do I juggle these balls? And then, to my surprise, even though he was named as a defendant, being the great guy he is, preacher's kid, actually, and a golfer, he invited me out for lunch. Not just me, but a couple of the other lawyers as well. So on his dime, he took us out for lunch. We had a good chance to talk with him. His manager, Shep Gordon, was with him. And Shep drove me back to the hotel in his uh, beautiful uh, limousine. And I asked uh, them about uh, Alice's rise. And what people, a lot of people don't know, and I'm going to get to Jack Richardson in a moment, but what a lot of people don't know is that Alice had made a couple of albums as Vincent Fournier, and they were going nowhere. Uh, he was doing his musical licks, and uh, people weren't just buying his records. He had a great live show, but uh, no success on records. And uh, Shep Gordon realized something had to change or this Alice Cooper is going nowhere. And that's when they hooked up with Jack Richardson. And apparently Jack meets the band and he's like, oh, I'm not sure these guys are my taste, but he sends Bob Ezrin in to deal with them. And together, Bob and Jack produced that iconic single, I'm 18. And I remember that song as a teenager, being of that age and so related to that song as the struggles between I'm a boy and I'm a man, I'm somewhere caught in the middle. But the production on that song with Jack behind it is so powerful. It still stands out to me as one of the best produced songs by Jack Richardson. And it really established uh, Alice Cooper on his career. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. <laughs> Once again, it was one of the many stories uh, and this is one of the things about Jack that uh, that so many people love, that Jack's not afraid to let someone else take the reins or get the credit or whatever for if they do something. And in the case of Alice, Jack, as you say, he wasn't quite sure uh, about that band and whatever. And so he sent Bob there and, and Bob was incredibly enthusiastic. And it was Bob's enthusiasm, really, that convinced Jack. And Jack said, okay, okay, if, if that's the way you feel about it, then, then let's do it. And uh, so uh, it was a kind of a tag team there thing. But uh, 
Jack, uh, yeah, when you listen to Jack's recordings, they're just, they're, they're so tight and they sound so good. And certainly I'm 18 is one of those. For sure. Now you mentioned also, I missed one of the great bands that Jack worked with, Poco. Yes. So, yeah. so once Jack starts to become well known as this great producer, uh, he's getting calls from all over the world, isn't he? He is. He's, he's traveling. He's, he's working, you know, like a lot of people would love to work. As a matter of fact, he was working so much that his wife, Shirley, put a full page ad in Billboard magazine saying, Jack, please come home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So how Jack does he decide, it? though? I mean, how does he weed through all the calls he's getting? How does he decide who he's going to produce and who he's not going to produce? With Jack, the song was the thing. If you had, if you had good songs, then he could work with you in the studio. You know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't one to uh, to say, I, I need the most incredible players. He said, but I need the the people who play the right things at the right time. Uh, but it was a song. Like I've seen Jack walk away from very lucrative jobs uh, with well-known bands, artists, because he didn't think they had the, the right material. Yeah, there's a great story on the internet on YouTube where Jack's talking about producing Bob Seger. And Bob's apparently in the studio and, and nothing's really clicking. Jack doesn't see it. And then he hears Bob uh, kind of strumming a little tune called Night Moves, which right. really wasn't developed yet. But uh, Jack's ears perked, perked up and he said, hey, let's hear that again. Let's see what we can do with that. Yeah. Of course, yeah. it became a huge hit. That's right. Well, Jack, uh, you know, it, it's interesting you say, let's hear that again, because you would never, ever in your life hear Jack Richardson say, that's a phenomenal song or that's a hit or whatever. Jack would go like this. He would go, not bad, <laughs> not bad at all. And if you got a not bad at all from Jack Richardson, you were, you were over the moon. That was the greatest compliment you could get. I think in all the years that, that uh, I shared an office with him and all the songs that I had from the past and I was writing, I may have played him three songs. <laughs> Because wow. you know? <laughs> you're not going to risk playing him something that he goes, you know, the yeah, silence right. or crickets or something right. like that. So. Okay, so up till now in this Jack Richardson story, Jack's in Toronto and other places, but then he decides to make the move to London. Yes. And he comes here and he lives here for the rest of his life, correct? That's correct. He was, uh, he got so bogged down running the recording studio that he was doing less and less production and more and more administration. And it just, it, it, it was overwhelming and he actually had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, his body told him it's time for a change. And Jack had been involved with the music industry arts program at Fanshawe College from the beginning. And, uh, and Jack's son, Garth Richardson had attended Fanshawe uh, for a while. Uh, Garth, by the way, as everybody knows, is a phenomenal producer in his own right. And uh, one of the things that Jack was most proud of was Garth's accomplishments. Oh. But anyways, Gar uh, Jack moved to London and uh, he was going to uh, teach production. Up to that point, I had taught record production. Oh. Well, <laughs> when Jack Richardson comes in, I go, I'm going over here to business, okay? And, yeah. and contracts. We'll leave the production to Jack. And he just did, uh, you know, he just stepped right into it, you know, it's, it's kind of a moving stream thing. But, it, you know, the kids loved him and, and he loved them and he loved, the, he loved the job. Well, tell us about your very first meeting with Jack. Um, I mean, obviously, okay. legend, he walks in, but yeah. uh, is he a down-to-earth guy, or does he? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell well, us. First, first of all, you have to remember that when, when Jack was, you know, in his prime 68, 69, 70, and, you know, having all these hits, I was still a struggling songwriter in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So whenever I heard of Jack Richardson, it was somewhere up there 
right while I was somewhere down here scurrying around and the rest of it. And um, I had actually seen him once, but not had the chance to talk to him. He came to London and uh, I was going to help him find a place to live uh, and uh, show him around the school. And I did. And he, I mean, this is kind of a small thing, but he had a brand new car. All right. Yeah. And so I said, I said, well, look, that I'll, I'll lead you to the motel. Just follow me in, in your car. Right. So we get about halfway to the motel and the biggest hailstorm you've ever seen oh, starts. No. And I start blaming myself. Right. I think, oh, good. Jack's going to, you know, he's going to, his car is going to get all banged up and he's going to remember the time that, you know, he was fine with it. He said, yeah. he said, if there's any problems, the insurance will take care of it. He was very easy going about those things. So he's a very easy man to meet. And you mentioned to me that he lived on Riverside Drive and then on Windermere and then at yeah. Amica on Fanshawe yeah. Park Road. That's right. Um, but does he come to London just because he's tired of what he was doing in Toronto? Or did he have something about wanting to teach and pass this art on to students? Did did he really care about his students? Oh, oh absolutely. Like it, it wasn't, he didn't have a question of, oh, you know, well, I'll take it easy and only produce a few things. He, he said, you know, I want to do this because he'd been involved from the beginning. And like I said, Garth had gone there. So, so this was something that he really wanted to do. And I'll tell you that his presence uh, in the music industry arts program is the reason that the program grew and has the facilities it had to, has today. Because you have to remember, when Jack came there, we had a little eight track uh, tape machine and a small Neve console, great console, but, you know, and small facilities. And because he was Jack Richardson, uh, Chum, uh, through their CRTC things that they do to help the industry, decided to give money to music industry arts at Fanshawe College. Wow. So they contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars because wow. Jack Richardson was there. So, well, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think he must be one of the reasons, uh, you as oh, well. Yeah why they're the number one uh, musical industry arts program in Canada. Well, for sure. And we for had sure. Don, Dan Broadback uh, was on one of our episodes talking about his work with Dolores O'Riordan of the Cranberries. Yeah. Well, that's, I'll stop you right there. That's another reason Fanshawe's number one is because of Dan Broadback and, and you know, all the other teachers who are there right now. They're terrific, terrific people. and the education that they're giving the students, Jack would be very pleased with it. And Dan was nominated for a Grammy for his work oh. with the Cranberries. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This is his, a career, his career is still going. His career yeah. is still going. Yeah. Yeah. A Londoner. And uh, we're yeah. so very proud of him and yeah. the program that you've been part of as well. So Jack, uh, we know he's passed on now. And I remember right. in 2011, uh, reading that story in the London Free Press and his funeral was planned at the church, uh, essentially beside my law office on Queen's Ave. And I attended in this massive church, St. Paul's, I think it was. Yes. yes. And it's just packed with people and the head yeah. spinning, you know, oh, I know this guy. Oh, that guy too. Yeah. Yes. And Bob Ezrin uh, spoke there and he told uh, beautiful. He the Alice beautiful. Cooper story. It was a beautiful uh, service. Yeah. I, I assume you were there or no? Oh yeah, I was there with uh, with Bob and Garth and uh, all the other people. Did you come afterwards across the street? I think it was Joe Cool's. We went to. I didn't the make it. Yeah. No, you didn't. Of course, okay. yeah. But um, it was it was a really special time. There were all kinds of people who you wouldn't know on site, but were very very influential names in the Canadian music industry. Yeah, it was well, it was great. Well, Terry, it's it's been a pleasure, and I I really it's over. It. I know time time <laughs> yeah, flies because that's right. Yeah, it, it's so fun talking about uh, people like Jack, and people that uh, have lived in London and have made such yeah. a major uh, impression yeah. on the world of music. 
Yeah, I, I'd like to mention yeah. one other thing. The, Jack got the uh, Order of Canada, mm. and he called me up one Saturday morning and said, I got to come see you. And I said, well, can you tell me over? He said, no, I got it. And he came and he, and he had this, you know, certificate that he had the Order of Canada. And, and he'd always been a real proud Canadian. And certainly uh, having the Order of Canada, which, by the way, a, another Londoner, Reiner Stotzer, uh, set that up, put in the nomination for him. So, but, uh, yeah. He was a true uh, London hero and Canadian hero. Absolutely. And it's been a pleasure speaking about him and trying to do some justice to his story. Uh, little details that many Londoners may not be familiar with. But thank you for taking the time to, yeah. to fill us in yeah. and tell us about uh, the legendary Jack Richardson. Someone I think we can all be proud of and he still left such a mark on the world of music that's uh, in inspiring others even today. And uh, his son, Garth, carries on the, the message. Yeah, well, thank, so, you for, thank you for thinking of him and to bringing him uh, to the public's notice. Well, as I say, pleasure's all mine. Thank you, uh, Terry McManus, for being here. It's been good to chat with you. Take care of yourself. And we'll be back soon with another episode of London Lights.